Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. First of all, I want to thank you guys for the great support you've given me in passing the thousand subscriber threshold. This is wonderful and spells good uh, things in the future for the channel. We can keep expanding, developing, uh, looking at new tools, developing at new strategies of taking things apart and uh, analyzing them. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the PBSAP 12 volt C3 version of the uh, miniature handheld drill. This is the third iteration, I believe, of the uh, 12 volt uh, drill with the 35 newton meter uh, torque specification. Previously, we had the uh, B2 and the A1, uh, the first generation, which only had 30 newton meters of torque. Uh, on the box here, nothing uh, too interesting or exciting. Uh, this is coming to us, let's see, from Grizzly Tools apparently. Nothing too surprising there. We get our standard little uh, carrying case with the uh, typical uh, sort of drilling tools. We have our three boxes of attachments. That's not too interesting. Some wood drills, some uh, metal drills, and some bits, uh, some instructions. And in the box, we get our two 2 amp hour uh, batteries, our charger, and the drill itself, which we have here. So Let's just move off this box to the side. Drill itself is certainly a development and an improvement maybe in some ways uh, to the previous version. As we can see here, this is the C3 uh, manufactured fairly recently this past October. And its main claim to fame is this nice removable chuck that gives you a quarter inch uh, sort of bit holder uh, on the tip and you can add this uh, uh, I believe it's what uh, eight two or I don't know, 0.82 or does it say that? Yeah, 0.82 10 millimeter uh, chuck for any drill bits you might want to add here. And this just has these uh, sort of ball bearing uh, mount system here that goes onto these little depressions in the shaft. You pull back the locking ring, you align it, you slip it on and it latches on tight. We have our standard spindle lock. Everything seems to work very nicely indeed. Interestingly enough, on the one I received, this sticker here is showing B2 markings, even though it has the C3 feature of the removable uh, chuck, but here on the other side, it's marked C3. So this is certainly very curious, since obviously the factory making them uh, we're producing both uh, C3 models and B2, like I have here, pretty much uh, at the same time. So let's have a look at this sort of weird development and the general evolution of these drills. What intrigued me was that uh, the A1 version uh, was 35 newton meter torque where the uh, B2 and C3 changed over to the uh, 35 newton meter uh, torque on the electric motor. So here we have the specification of the C3. Here we have the B2. This was made in August, so just uh, a couple of months uh, before this one here. And I do even have an A1 version here that uh, you can see its panel, and we can see this one is marked being manufactured in May 21. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that we have A1, and then a couple of months later, already B2, and then C3. But obviously the factory making them uh, just had sort of one stack of stickers, and they didn't realize they were passing to the next model number, and just kept using the B2 stickers they had left over, I guess, on the uh, first few units, even though this is marked serial number 42,000. Uh, we still have a B2 sticker uh, on the C3. Let me know down in the comments below if you own one of these C3 versions with a removable chuck, if your sticker is also B2, or as in the uh, advertising pictures on Little's website, it actually says C3. So I was uh, kind of interested to see how this sort of removable chuck uh, you know, is going to perform. Uh, it does kind of look nice that, you know, you can have your drill bit mounted here, you're drilling some holes, you want to put in a screw, you don't have to change your bit here. You can just pull this off, pull your, let's say, Torx bit in here and drive some screws. But, um, 
I have to say the uh, original B2 uh, seems to be sort of nicer to use to me. First of all, something that might not be that important is that it can actually stand upright. Uh, because the center of gravity on the C3 is moved forward by the chuck, you'll see that it's going to fall over. So B2 can stand up, C3 is going to fall down. Now, I guess if you put on the uh, four amp hour or five amp hour battery, it might uh, be able to stand upright, but with the removable chuck, it will definitely not stand on its own. Certainly not something to be really concerned about, but you know, something to consider. Also, if you look at the chucks, uh, the B2 version, uh, I don't see this marked as room anywhere, but it certainly looks like a copy or at least a sort of non-branded uh, production of the room chuck, while the uh, C3 version, it has something that looks very similar, but it's obviously not in the same sort of quality class as the B2. Uh, certainly uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, knurled surface here is kind of sharp. The colors are sort of more, you know, grayish, not as a deep black as this one here. And, you know, while more aggressive knurling is actually better for grip, it kind of feels a little bit cheap. And when you look at this plastic here, if we can get some focus, please, thank you. Um, you can see, you know, it's it's not the best. The, uh, the size markings are just in the plastic here, where here we have some uh, size markings embossed into the metal itself. So mm, probably function wise, they should be pretty identical. This looks quite sturdy to me. All of these sort of uh, camming surfaces inside here look to be fairly sturdy. Um, there is, I guess, a little bit of slop in the whole system, especially when you have it uh, mounted on here. But it uh, general, I think it uh, performs quite well. So that's my opinion on the difference between the B2 and C3. But let's have a look at how the internals actually uh, progressed from the original uh, A1 version. So here we have my uh, disassembled uh, assistants. Uh, and we have their internals. So this is the A1, this is the B2. So if we just have a quick look at just the uh, shell casings here, um, we have sort of an interesting idea how and where they were manufactured. So this is the A1 version, and this is the B2. And if we look inside, we can see that we have some nice uh, date stamps here, and we have some material uh, stamps uh, right on this small inner corner. And if we sort of zoom into our date stamps, on the A1 version, we see a production date of 21 and month nine. So this is September 21, A1 version. Even though the sticker here says May 21, this is actually a September production. And the B2, which uh, here it says it's an August 08, 21 production. If we peek inside its case, uh, we see that the uh, date mold stamps are in different locations and the material specification is in a different place. And if we look at our date stamps here, we have a date of 21 on the one side and we have the month stamp month of eight, so August, uh, on the other side. So actually the uh, A1 version casing at least was manufactured uh, uh, later than the B2, which is interesting. And my idea was, okay, this is all being manufactured in the same factory. Since the casings are all identical, they're just stamping them out and then they sort of build it up into either A1, B2, or C3 version. But interestingly enough, if we look at the casings, um, and I think if this was all manufactured in one factory, all the sort of molds and sort of design would be uh, similar. But if we have a 
look here. So in this factory, in the A1 version, we have our date stamps here, whereas in the B2 version, we have them in the handle. Here we have the material mark uh, in this small area, while in the B2, we have it in this larger area here. And then we have, uh, we have the same sides here. We see that sort of our mold release features here. So here we have this sort of long line. Uh, here we don't have that long line. So the release sort of geography between the molds is actually rather different. So you could really say that these two came from two different production facilities, because as I said, I ex I'd expect the molds to be pretty identical inside the same factory. They have their own sort of uh, tool makers. Uh, they maintain, you know, the same standard. Okay, we're going to put the date stamp here and not here, and we're going to put the material here and there, and you know, the different release pins when they go to push it out of the uh, injection mold, they'd so probably standardize that within the same factory. So if we look at the internal guts here, we have are sort of uh, gear cases. Uh, both of them are pretty much identical. There's nothing much to see here. Uh, really no changes or differences between either, just a bit of a color change on the plastic. But if we go to the rotors and the electric motors, this is where we get our biggest differences. So. I'm going to have to fight this one here and pull off all the little metal work it's collected. But if we look at the motors, we can actually see that there's quite a difference. So if I can hold them apart, we can see that the motor, and this is from the A1 and this is the B2, the A1 motor actually is longer and bigger. So uh, width wise, uh, they are the same diameter, but length, this is a 20 millimeter stator, and this is just a 15 millimeter stator. And if we look here, we do have some mount, uh, markings on the rotors. Here we have CK3815-210701 on the B1, uh, B2 version and on the A1 version on the bigger rotor we have this marking 115.8E13201. Doesn't mean too much. If we look at the motors themselves, uh, this is the A1 motor. We have uh, this marking here, 117-8E13201. Uh, this is a 38 millimeter diameter and 20 millimeter uh, stator length. And we have about one millimeter uh, diameter wire going to our six pole stator. Uh, in the A1 or the B2 version, sorry, we have a 15 millimeter stator in comparison to the 20 millimeters on the A1. So this is actually shorter by five millimeters and we maintain our same uh, diameter of 38 millimeters. So the B2 version that steps up from uh, 30 newton meters of torque to 35 actually has a smaller uh, electric motor compared to the A1 version. So the blue one here is A1, this is B2. B2 is five newton meters uh, stronger in torque as the A1 version, but it has a smaller stator. So this is really weird. I was thinking when I saw the uh, change in torque, I was thinking, okay, they upgraded the electric motor just a little bit and that gave them sort of a numerical five uh, newton meter advantage. But actually they reduced the size of the motor. So if we look at the sort of uh, electronicals here. Uh, let me see what angle I can show you. Uh, on the A1 uh, rotor here, we have our wires coming off of our three phases from the control board. And here we see we have two wires going down to two poles for each phase. While on the uh, B2 version, we have this sort of braided multi-wire uh, connection going on to the electric motor. And I've counted this, the angles aren't really easy to see, but each of these three phases actually has four one millimeter wires going to the poles. So again, we have six poles, but we have four wires coming from the control board into the electric motor uh, compared to two wires going uh, uh, from the control board into the motor in the A1 version. So I'm no expert in sort of brushless DC motor topography and design, but sort of the basic rule of thumb and formula is that the larger the diameter of the stator, 
and rotor and the longer uh, the stator and rotor the more power uh, the, the motor has. So in this sort of size reduction we've actually lost power compared to the A1 version but there seems to be more windings uh, on the B2 version since here we have four wires coming from the board compared to just two on the A1 version. Uh, they're actually feeding more current and thereby generating more magnetic flux uh, in the smaller B2 version to make up for that reduction in physical size. They're pushing more uh, electricity through the this motor and that's how they're making up the shortfall of motor strength by running higher currents in the motor. And if we look at the control boards again here uh, A1 version we uh, can see some markings here on the board. Uh, these don't really mean too much to me at the moment. Uh, Venkt, that's not uh, sort of a, a company that shows up on the internet. But if we look at the uh, board here, we see there's quite a lot of uh, surface mount components on here. Here we have an ST, STM, I believe, 8 what is it here? STM 8S903. So we have a microprocessor on here. Here we have this unmarked multi-pin chip, which is probably the uh, brushless motor control since all its sort of connections are going through these uh, three diodes and capacitors and running to the gates of the MOSFETs. Then we have this uh, sort of uh, uh, re power regulator here and a bunch of surface mount components here. We have a uh, uh, an op amp here. So plenty of components and quite an expensive uh, uh, bill of materials on this board. Whereas when we take a look at the B2 version, this one is super simple. So compared to the uh, numerous components we have here, on the B2 version, we only have this big uh, microprocessor blob, a couple of surface mount components, and then pretty much nothing except for the uh, MOSFETs that are running the motor on the backside. So we, we've we definitely seen a redesign uh, on the board. And I'll actually do a separate video where I'm going to go through all these components, put up a uh, bill of materials and just show you and calculate how much money they saved actually redesigning the board into the B2 version compared to the A1. So the only thing that could really change the performance of these two motors is the kind of MOSFETs they use. Because because uh, you know the 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 better MOSFETs or the lower uh, resistance MOSFETs you use, the more current you can drive without overheating. And as you can see on both of these boards, uh, they've gone to the effort of providing some sort of heat sinking uh, just by gluing these sort of one millimeter aluminium plates uh, with some uh, thermally conductive glue onto the boards. But here we have our two uh, different kinds of transistors. On this board, we have our surface mount DFN uh, 56 packages. I'm not sure we're going to be able to focus on to here, but if you can see, we have uh, some uh, N-channel MOSFETs marked NDU1511. These are 30 volt, 100 amp, 2.4 uh, milliohm RDS on MOSFETs. Whereas on the B2 version, we have our uh, TO252 uh, sized MOSFETs. These are marked uh, 100N03. And these are also 30 volt, 100 amp MOSFETs with 3 milliohms of uh, RDS on, so just a little bit higher resistance than these, but the uh, uh, TO252 uh, package has better thermal characteristics from the surface mount uh, DFN56. So actually, you know, in the wash of things, these uh, bigger MOSFETs in the B2 version might be able to push uh, just a few extra amps compared to the A1 version. As far as our controls on the uh, trigger modules go, we have identical trigger modules, I believe, if I can uh, dig this up, uh, or if not identical, pretty similar ones. So in the A1 version, uh, we have this uh, ZT06 uh, trigger module, whereas in the B2, uh, we have something different, uh, DSO3-1, Shanghai company uh, voltages and currents are identical. So these are pretty much sort of off the shelf trigger modules they've used. As you can see, external design is pretty much identical. Uh, no protective boots 
uh, at least no protective boot on the B2 version. On the A1, we have this little piece of rubber that's almost non-existent, but it's interesting to see that there is sort of a uh, tendency of uh, uh, economics being done to these products, making the B2 version cheaper than the A1. So if we disassemble the trigger module and uh, we pull off this uh, top cover, we can see quite similar to the other uh, performance uh, models, we have sort of two uh, wipers uh, connected to the trigger and then this top connection for the directional switch. And that again feeds to the sort of typical configuration uh, we have here, we have our sort of resistive track here for the speed, and then we have our kind of wake up signal on these bottom contacts here, and this all goes to six wires going to the control board. So nothing too surprising uh, in there, sort of design wise, quite similar, but definitely some cheapening going on uh, with the B2 version. Not that that would uh, maybe impact performance, it actually might even perform better than the sort of first generation, maybe you could call it overcomplicated uh, version in the A1. Uh, here we have some nice 18 American wire gauge silicone wires. Here we've gone to, you know, 18 gauge still, but slightly cheaper feeling uh, PVC. So, you know, in general, there is this sort of uh, 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 budget cutting uh, going on from generation to generation, which to me isn't exactly clear since, you know, uh, Parkside and their Chinese manufacturers, they aren't designing these tools from scratch and that this is, you know, their sort of first generation attempt at making a brushless drill. I mean, they, they've manufactured these for years already. So I'm surprised that sort of their first entry to market is actually not uh, gone through a sort of cost cutting procedure and optimization, uh, that that sort of uh, procedure has to happen from one mo uh, model to the other, maybe sort of profit margins uh, change or they get tighter and whatnot and then little demands uh, uh, lower prices and then the Chinese engineers sort of go to the more integrated uh, way of uh, running these devices. But it's certainly interesting to see these changes as they go on. So I just have a few uh, disassembly and reassembly tips when you uh, go to repair or uh, look at your machine. Uh, there are three things that, uh, you know, bear reminding where they go. There's this little clip here. Uh, this goes onto the back of the both of these drills. So we have this little clip. This just slides on to here and it holds both of these uh, two uh, clamshell halves together. So this little metal piece goes onto here. And then when you disassemble everything, uh, you will find this metal piece lying on your table and you'll have no clue what it does or where it goes. Where it goes in both of the models is onto the left hand uh, clamshell with this uh, T-shaped metal uh, uh, end pointing outwards. It goes into this little channel in here and it serves as the spring for the uh, chuck torque setting. So it just slides, uh, slides onto here, sits in this little depression, as you can see, just here, and you just slide it on, sits in there. And this serves as the spring to provide the click, click, click action when you turn this. Uh, also the sort of torque setting on the chuck, as you can see, it all sort of moves around. There is some alignment uh, that you have to take care of when putting this back on. So when you take it off, don't sort of twist and turn it and get it out of alignment. The pointer needs to be at the top. This needs to also be at the top, which is the gear selection, first gear, second gear. And uh, then this has to be this ring that sets the uh, torque has to be aligned correctly, or you'll have it, you know, sitting at torque 17, where actually it's at zero or whatever. So be careful with that. Uh, finally, uh, an interesting change from one version to the other. So in the A1 version, we have our uh, gear selection uh, piece here and this just has this sort of simple cutout uh, that mounts onto here that just 
sort of slips onto there and you can see that hole aligns with this plastic tab and once you have it set on there you can move it and then you have this sort of spring that just indexes uh, with these wings into some holes in the plastic casing to, just to give you the sort of click click into first and second gear but interestingly enough uh, this simple plastic hole and this little tab in the A1 uh, version have uh, evolved into uh, the same type of tab on the gear case, but a larger hole uh, on this plastic piece and this little black spring. And this little black spring will also be a part that uh, you'll just find lying on your table or like in my case, glued to the magnet on the rotor and you won't really know where it goes. And uh, surprisingly enough in the manual on the last page, they do have sort of an, uh, a parts diagram and an exploded view, but it just shows uh, the single piece. It doesn't show where the spring goes. So this spring actually lies inside this piece and you can you can mount it into this hole and then when you uh, connect the uh, gear change mechanism uh, it sort of uh, fits into uh, that little spring and I, I really don't understand why they changed that and, and what prompted them, them to do this change, but that just makes it easier. So when you switch to first gear, you switch to first gear, but when you push into second, there's just that little bit of spring force, I don't know, to make the button more comfortable to switch gears when you push it into second, that there's not like plunk a hard stop, that there's this sort of soft feel to it. I, I really don't know. This is obviously a cost in parts, which I agree is minimal, but it certainly is a very fumbly operation for the people putting these tools together for the operators to install. So I don't really understand why they'd go from simple to complicated without any reason. I, I haven't had any experience or, or feel that there is a need to add a spring to the gear selection. But anyways, that's that. I uh, hope this sort of little short presentation uh, was interesting to you to look at uh, these sort of evolution of models uh, in one tool series. Oh yeah, and one more thing, this little brushless panel on the back, when you're taking it apart, obviously it's hooked around both of these. Take some kind of small pick or whatnot and very carefully pull up the edges of these uh, sort of spikes in here that uh, lock into the clamshells with these hooks and then you won't break this little piece. So as I said, interesting sort of deep dive into these tools. Maybe I'll do another video uh, looking closer at uh, these boards, the price of components, the way they have things set up. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in that. Again, thank you for watching. Do subscribe to the channel. Uh, we will definitely be making headway in the future and as the channel grows, we'll be able to do more interesting things. So once again, thanks for being with us today and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.